Hello everybody, Samuel here from TFI Creations here once again with MK. We are on episode 2 of the TFI podcast uh, that we'll, we'll be again releasing every month and we're finally getting the ball rolling on June's. So MK, say hello. Hello, Sam. You're gonna have to get this uploaded in like five days. <laughs> Yo, I mean, that's a lot of For it. For context, we are recording this on June 25th, 2023. Yeah, we were supposed to record it last week, but a thing, an emergency came up, so that just didn't happen. But uh, you had to get your teeth fixed. I did have to get my teeth fixed. Your I, inner British was coming out. My inner British is always coming out. First thing I want to do is on the last episode, we got a single question, which is, "What is our opinions on Transformers Reactivate?" It was from Negative Carnage. Oh, we got the one question. All right. <laughs> we're, we're doing... MK, we did it. <laughs> we made it. We made it. <laughs> uh, our thoughts on Transformers Reactivate. Uh, you want to shoot first? Oh. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I mean, I think it looks good. I need to wait to see gameplay. I like Warframe, and I don't mind the whole Battle Pass system. I, I don't know. It doesn't bother me. If I don't like it, I won't buy it. Like, I'll just play the free part of the game. Easy peasy. I have to wait to see gameplay. But so far, everything about it that I've heard, I enjoy. Yeah, I mean, I can pretty much say the same thing. From everything I've seen to the designs to the concept, like, it sounds fun. Like, it sounds really fun. And it sounds like it's a story that we haven't seen, that we haven't really seen too much of. Um, I do, I, I, I need to see more. I, I, I need to see gameplay. Or at least more of a cinematic trailer to give me more of a feel of what they're going for. But from what we've seen, uh, I'm positive. I'm, I'm quite positive. I feel like there's not much to talk about just yet. But uh, once we get more information, it will definitely be dis- something discussed on the podcast. Oh, yeah, for sure. So right before recording this, I actually I just got back from the movies because I was watching Spider-Verse again for the third time. I've seen it three times in theaters. And I want to go again. You need help. I don't need help. You I need, need help. to see Spider Verse. Okay, fair. I, do, are you saying you don't want to keep seeing Spider Verse? I I want to keep seeing Spider Verse, but I've only seen it once. What? Why not? Go I, to theaters more often. I, Go I, right now. I I can't. We're recording the podcast. You're making me use high voice. Uh, I've been liking that a lot. Although I'm not gonna dwell too much on that because this is not a Spider Man podcast. Um, is there another movie that? Would be more relevant to the podcast? I, I I'm not sure if there's any other movies. I mean, oh, the new Indiana Jones is coming out this Friday. That that looks interesting. I'm excited for that. You know, you know, I yeah. I, I don't think there are any other movies we could talk about on a Transformers podcast. Like, no, what, no, what, I don't what? think there's anything really relevant. I mean, I don't know. There was that that small little indie film that came out. You know, Rise of the Beasts. Did you see that? No, no, it's too look too low budget for me and too low budget. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I, okay, okay, no, I'm, I, no, we're, we're, we're killing the viewers, we're killing the viewers. What are you doing? I don't know, all I know is Rise of the Beasts, that was fun, good movie. Uh, I think we, we, part of the reason why it took so long to record this episode is the fact that Sam had to wait for me to see it, and I didn't, well, I mean, I, technically I could have, like, I didn't even watch it that later, or that much later, I watched it like three days after the premiere, but that was still, you know. I guess too late for Sam, because I didn't see it day one. I saw, okay, the movie came out on Friday, technically. I saw it on the Thursday. Yeah, good for you. Yeah. Technically, movies now at this point come out on Thursday. Yeah, they do. No, I I um thoroughly enjoyed Rise of the Beast a lot. Like, a lot, a lot. It's definitely up there as one of my favorite Transformers films to ever release. No, I, I, I enjoyed it quite a bit. I feel like, I don't know if this is a hot, I feel like this is the most neutral take, but I feel like it's right in the middle for me. Before, before we continue, I just want to say, uh, at this point, we're going to be talking about Rise of the Beasts, and we will probably be talking spoilers. So if you haven't seen the movie, I recommend going to the theater now, watching the movie, coming back, and then listening to the podcast. Yeah, like, go now. Like, right now. Yeah. But if you haven't seen Spider-Verse, watch that, too. Yeah, do do yeah. a double feature. Do yeah. a double feature. Just, oh. just cycle through the movies. Just walk out of Rise of the Beasts into Spider-Verse, out of Spider-Verse, into Rise of the Beasts. Just, uh, like, a, who, who, needs, who needs anything else other than that? Just, just watch the movies over and over. I mean, I've, I've seen Rise of the Beast in theaters twice already, and that's not enough. I do need to see it another time in theaters. I do really want to see it um, again. I found my first viewing of Rise of the Beast was honestly impacted by the fact that I just wanted to see robots. 
Like I'm all I'm all for you know human characters, and I love the character of of Noah and Elena. I loved them, but I wanted to see robots. So when the human scenes came up, I was like, okay, I get these scenes are for development, but show me robots. By the time my second viewing came, I could appreciate the human scenes more because I already knew when the robots were coming. And that allowed me to enjoy it as a whole a lot more because I wasn't finding myself waiting for the action and the robots. And he and hell, even when the robots do come in, when they finally come in, they're there like 90% of the time. See, that was the thing about it is like I didn't – the human scenes didn't bother me because the movie's so go, go, go. We barely even set time with the humans. It was very much, hey, get to the get to the robots. Um, I think – my biggest issues with it overall were just simply the pacing. I agreed with a lot of people that the pacing was kind of all over the place. Rise of the Beast does so much other good stuff that I can over, you know, overlook the action scenes not being my personal favorite because there's more to a film than just robots smashing into each other. I just, yeah, th that, I feel like it's it's just a case of, I mean, this happens with all of them, but like the fact Battle Trap and Nightbird never really got any like actual fight scenes. You know, I, I was expecting, I, I don't know, I think I was expecting more of, like, more actual, like, engagements rather than characters shooting at each other. Yeah, but I mean, I have to say, like, I, I love the the Peru chase, like, on, on the hill, where a lot, yes. of, a lot of their alt modes were, were utilized. And I love, I mean, the one thing I loved about Rise of the Beast, and this, this pertains to this one particular, particular scene, is the, 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 the number of transformations there were. I, I it was It was fun to see, like, everyone, I think... Everyone except Air Razor, and then I think everyone except Air Razor transformed at least once. Optimus Prime, especially, like he was constantly going in and out of um, alt mode and then robot mode. I feel like do people do underestimate the amount of transformations that can be in a transformer scene because they'll see like certain characters not transform. Because like, I know this is gonna be a hot take, but like I know people bring up transformations. TLK actually has a decent amount of transformations, except for Optimus. Except for Optimus. Optimus is the only person who doesn't transform in that movie, but I think most of the characters get a, at least, you know, robot to vehicle. Which reminded me of another transformation in Rise of the Beast, right before the Peru Hill Chase. You, like, you see Scourge land and transform, Nightbird land that and transform. That shot. Then, so good. That shot is so cool, just the way that all, it's like the same angle. That, like you were saying, that whole Peru chase sequence, that is probably my favorite action scene in the film. I, I love car action scenes in Transformers movies because I like when they use their alt modes. That especially, I thought was really good. Yeah, the whole like battle trap hooking onto Nightbird and then spinning around. Um, I love RC popping in and out of like Wheeljack in the different spots. Yeah, I quite liked that. That was good. And Battle Trap got to do one thing in that movie, which was knock <laughs> RC and Wheeljack off the side of the mountain. Someone uh, give me a real fight. <laughs> real fight. No. Okay. So I again, this might be a hot take, but I know some people were probably upset with that. I loved. I would have liked Nightbird to have a little bit more, but I loved that Battle Trap was simply not that guy. He never <laughs> once in the movie does anything of note. Even in the museum fight, he kind of shoots at a couple of them and then doesn't do much. Like, Scourge is doing all the damage. Battle Trap's just existing. I think Nightbird actually, if I remember, Nightbird actually throws hands a bit, but Battle Trap does nothing. And then when he said he's the first, like, he dies in the beginning of the final act, before most of the goons die. Yeah, yeah. He, he talks so much shit and cannot back it up. It's just, <laughs> I love how they show that shot in the trailer where he's swinging his mace around and it's like meant to be this cool thing. And then it cuts. And then when you watch the movie, it immediately cuts because Primal just grabs it. Yeah. And he has to say, someone get me a real, like, oh, it was the most you are not that guy pal scene. And I personally loved it. I thought the idea of like, Everyone, every single person, when the toy was revealed and then the trailer came out, was hyping up Battle Trap to be this, like, oh, man, he's so cool. He's this, and then he turned out to be this guy who just gets instantly destroyed. I mean, he puts up zero fight. I love it. I, I love it. it it's, it's, <laughs> uh, I, I love how he gets destroyed. I love how, and, and, and Primal just does, like, the three swings right on his face, and I just, I love yeah. the, I love this, the quick zoom into Battle Trap's face before it happens, too, and you just mm -hmm. hear these, like, horrified grunts come from Battle Trap, and I'm thinking, this is the, th at this moment, he knew he effed up. <laughs> it just, I love I, it. I will say, I love David Silva in his interviews, like, Battle Trap is the most sadistic character ever, bro. 
You're not that guy. You're not that guy. Um, the rest of the Terracon, obviously Scourge showed up, but like, I, Scourge was the the Terracons with Scourge versus without Scourge are night and day. Without Scourge, the Terracons would be nothing. Nightbird does a little bit, but even then, even then, Nightbird's kind of the one time she does anything, she's fighting a human. Yeah. I guess, no, she does take RC out of the fight. It's off screen, but she does take RC out of the fight for a good chunk of the movie. Because at the very beginning, you see RC get knocked away by Nightbird, and then she does not come back until, like, the long charge sequence towards the end. I really love the the connection between Primal and Optimus. I, I kind of like the idea that, like, you know, o- Optimus Primal was named after Optimus. And he has that talk with Air Razor, basically saying, A.O. Prime fell off. Yeah. Right. Um, That's not the Optimus Prime, I, or he's not the Optimus Prime I thought, or something like that. Yeah, right? so, something like that. And no, I I, I like that because I I really like Optimus Primal was used to tell us things about Optimus himself, and I love that this Optimus, you know, people say he's similar to like the Bayverse, but this Optimus has an arc, and it's a really nice arc, and I and I really like it. Like in the beginning, you're not really supposed to like this Optimus too much. You're like, oh, okay, that was cold and dark. And then by the end, he he gives his speech. He's compassionate, and he and he's like he's destroying, like he destroys his only chance to go home for Earth, a planet he didn't even care about in the beginning of the film. I was gonna say I definitely like Prime's arc, but I think it's just a case with the pacing of like it. His arc unfortunately suffers again from the pacing because it kind of goes from one scene he's oh I don't work with humans, and then the next scene he's like you know what humans aren't that bad, like it it isn't as a slow of a progression as I'd like or like. As not slow, as smooth as a progression as I would have liked. It's very much he's kind of one way, and then something happens, and he's like, you know what, I'm wrong. The other thing I guess I wasn't a huge fan of Rise of the Beast for, and it's not this film's fault. Had this film just existed, it wouldn't have bothered me. But I'm going to sue Stephen Capel Jr. <laughs> Because this is for the Air Razor's, that, yeah, yeah. Air Razor's death took so much out. Of, the fact she's the maximal that died made me like roll my eyes because I felt I was like when I watched it, I was like I'm so tired of Air Razor dying. And then I went, wait, that's not a thing that happens in official Transformers media. That's just something we did first. Yep. And so my brain just automatically is like, okay, that because so they left it to the four characters of Rhinox, Cheetor, Primal, and air razor which is the exact four characters we used yep count it like not counting you know we stripped tigatron and rat trap and then we had dinobot stay a predacon so it was that same four cast and then they killed the exact same one <laughs> we chose to kill yeah i yep. not to mention and you pointed this out there is a literal shot yep. <laughs> that is so similar to something we used and Return to earth where i was just i was like i was like damn Hasbro, what the hell? No. I, I actually don't want to believe that anyone, like, I don't, truthfully, I do not think anyone on, like, I don't think Stephen Cable Jr. or anyone on that team actually watched our film, but it would have been really cool if they did. Because, <laughs> I mean, like, there's literally a shot where you see Stratosphere flying through the clouds and Air Razor pulls up beside him flying. That was literally a shot in Return to From Earth Re- with Skylix. Yeah, and Return to Earth, it was one thing if, like, Return to Earth was being made, but Return to Earth was filmed and released, like, what, two years ago? Three years ago? Yeah. Like, they were still filming and, like, working on Rise of the Beasts. Like, there... So, there was a similarity between Finest Hour and Rise of the Beasts. So, I did not know, from the beginning, that there was going to be the Unicron medley played throughout. How did you not know? I did not know. I did not know this. How? I f- I knew that was going to be a thing since the moment Unicron was revealed. I, I that, there's no way they weren't. I see. I that didn't cross my mind. And um, every time you see Unicron, you hear the same four notes from his '80s yes. theme in Rise of the Beast. Yes, and it's so good, and I love it. It sounds great. But before Rise of the Beast came out, we released Finest Hour, and in Finest Hour, those same four notes play throughout. The film. Every time you see Unicron, they play. Anytime there's a sad moment that's like part of Unicron or something, those four notes play. In 
defense, it was already done for Rise of the Beast by the time Finest Hour would have been out. Yeah, because Finest Hour only came out like two weeks ago. <laughs> I know, it was longer than that. It's just a neat coincidence to 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 know that like what we had in mind for Finest Hour was what they had in mind for Rise of the Beast. Oh my god, Hasbro thought to use Unicron's theme in Unicron <laughs> scenes? <laughs> Listen, Whoa! There. Oh my gosh, that's such... Kidding. I'm just messing. <laughs> to be fair, um, we we haven't heard that theme since the '80s, and Unicron has been prominent in other things, in shows that couldn't probably afford it. <laughs> fair. This wasn't a movie, but it's it's. I mean, with... but it's not just that. But like, look, look at look at the the original uh, Transformers Interstellar and the remake, where Galvatron and Nemesis Prime team up. That ended up happening in Kingdom. They are stealing from us, MK. <laughs> Stephen Cable Jr. and Hasbro are wired into this Discord right now. I think you just are giving yourself too much credit for basic ideas. <laughs> also, basic ideas. Also, also, the idea of that it goes way. There's Transformers history that way before Warf Cybertron and stuff like that because it doesn't. It's not hard concept to make two people associated with Unicron work together. Because obviously Galvatron was associated with Unicron in the 1980s, and Nemesis was associated with Unicron, you know, decades ago too, in Armada. But you wouldn't know that. You can't let me have this, can you? No, I can't. You cannot let me have you this. You, you didn't know that. You cannot let me have this. Nemesis was <laughs> a pawn of Unicron in Armada. I knew this. Because I told you. A couple, I, I, like two years ago. I, yeah, I still knew it. This is how Sam becomes a fan of a Transformers character. He sees a toy, he thinks, ooh, shiny, and then he buys it, and then he likes the toy, so then he's like, hey, what's this toy about? And that's how that's how it happens. Or sometimes he doesn't even do that. Sometimes you just go, hmm, I like this toy. I'm going to just make my own thing with it. That's You, you literally just explained the origin of Crosscut in Interstellar and, oh, and First Aid. <laughs> yeah. I, was... the, I liked the Crosscut toy, and I knew nothing about him. <laughs> You were just like, ah, hey, like, oh wow, that's a that's a cool toy. Let me let me do my own thing. And, nah, and I'm gonna do my own thing. The really funny thing is when it comes to like first aid, because the only reason why I love first aid so much is because of like, you know, TFI stuff. It wasn't until after the rollout stuff I actually watched that G1 uh, episode with with first aid in it. And first aid, I didn't realize was a pacifist until I looked up his stats. Which is funny, because you can't find it anymore, but there is a prologue that was released for Rollout 1 where Optimus was interrogating Breakdown. And Optimus is like, you know, you will tell us this, this, and that. And Breakdown goes, whoa, if I don't, what are you going to do about it? First Aid comes in with an axe. With a sadistic <laughs> voice going, something I will do myself. And I'm like... Oh, because oh I, I uploaded that and someone commented, isn't First Aid a pacifist? And I'm like, oh, <laughs> oh, is he? I also like how we don't know anything about the Terracon still. Like they left that. Everyone was waiting for this movie to prove or debunk fan theories. It did none of this. It. And like, I want to make some fan films about it, but I'm worried that they'll get retconned in the next ones. Oh, they are. They are definitely. So, yeah. Rise of the Beast, I really enjoyed. Uh, I give it probably a 7 out of 10. Good movie. Good movie. I feel like I felt I seemed a little negative, but I want to be said that I thoroughly enjoyed the movie a lot. So, Sam, what did you think of Rise of the Like, what would you, you, you... I mean, you've said it was a good movie, but, like, you know, final, just final wrapping up thoughts on Rise of the Beast? I think my final thoughts on it, like, I, I do think it's my second favorite Transformers film. Um, there are some issues I have it with it, but the more the more, like, technical problems that I had with it. But I I really would give it like a nice solid either seven and a half or eight out of, out of ten like eight feels a bit too high but seven feels feels a bit too low because I, I I think in, enjoyment factor definitely way way up there like for enjoyment I'd give it like a nine out of ten as a film itself I I would go eight out of ten for sure. It's what's your favorite? My favorite Transformers film, Dark of the Moon. Good man. Yeah. Smart answer. <laughs> it now I'm going to ask a hot take. Okay. Spider-Verse or Rise of the Beast? Rise of the Beast. What? Yeah, right? I don't... You think Spider-Verse is less than a 7 out of 10? No. But I enjoyed Rise of the Beast a bit more. 
it's it's strictly because I it hurts my brain to think. And Spider Verse was a very thought provoking film, and I love that about that. I really do. But Rise of the Beast, I could just go in and just have a grand time. But like I I have much more love for Transformers than I than I I, I really do Spider Man. No, but again, I've seen Across the Spider Verse once. I need to see it again. I will say I feel like my enjoyment of Across the Spider Verse definitely got stronger on more rewatchings, just because I feel like a a lot of the issues I had first time viewing were more upset or were more negative expectations rather than like actually problems with the film. So rewatching it, it's a matter of, you know, going back. Cause I think going into spider verse versus going into rise of the beast. Cause when I first saw them, I actually had the same opinion. I'm not going to lie. The first time when I got out of the theater, to see both of them, uh, my opinion was I enjoyed rise of the beast more, but upon reflecting and actually watching the other films, it's because I went into Spider Verse with expectations. I went into Rise of the Beast with no expectations. Yeah, I, I feel like that's the thing. I've seen Rise of the Beast more than I've seen Spider Verse, so I need to give Spider Verse another uh, another full watch. So, anyone watching, uh, let us know your thoughts of Rise of the Beast and Spider Verse if you want. Although Rise of the Beast is technically more related to the podcast, so well, you know, did you like it? What? I, uh... What do you mean by that, Sam? You and I have discussed one. I've been meaning to mention you've been talking about a certain thing, and I was like, "Are you gonna forget what you pitched to me?" Like, oh no, I I I remember, and I'm thinking we could tie the the ideas together. I never actually had any ideas for the Spider Man film you wanted to do. I simply was just told to be a voice actor, and I went okay. <laughs> well, I have some I because I you saw the test shots I did with some Marvel Legends. Yes. Yeah, I feel like we could pull something off and the the say i mean i still need to make that halo film and i'm still down to make that because i want to start expanding yeah. tfi into more stuff as well mm -hmm. but uh we shall see we shall see for sure so the most recent film that just came out finest hour how was that made how how was that made yeah show the tell tell us the whole process the, the whole, whole film the, the whole okay yeah. so Go scene by scene, scene okay by scene. okay okay so it was about three years ago <laughs> It's, uh, it was funny you mentioned that because Finest Hour was an idea that was around for a long time. In fact, even before the Interstellar remake was a thing, we were thinking about doing a TLK sequel. Finest Hour went through so many rewrites and rewrites because even the original poster I made for Finest Hour contained the original TLK like premium edition Bumblebee and Hot Rod. Like we were we were gonna make it way back when. And in one of the earliest ideas, it was so overly complex, and I really wasn't feeling it. Like uh, my notebook here fully says that like there was going to be a scene where they they were supposed to recreate the Allspark. They were going to use the space bridge. They were going to somehow use the Energon harvester again. Uh, they were going to use everything from the past movies to to just like solve the problem and it was meant to like pay tribute to all the films but it just wasn't working and originally it does not work for your filming style that that you would need like a full budget like two hour long movie to yeah. tell that story and originally they were gonna in the original concept they were gonna break into a warehouse steal sentinel prime's remaining arm to power the pillars <laughs> Mm -hmm. And, like, there was no need for that. Just explain you can use one by yourself. We explained that in Origins Unknown, so we, we just brought it over. But the main thing that stopped us from making Finest Hour so long ago is we didn't know what Paramount was doing with their films. There were rumors that Rise of the Beast was still a prequel. There were rumors that there, there was going to be... In a defense, we also still don't know. Yeah. We there, still don't know. The Rise of the Beast didn't answer anything. There's, it's still in limbo. There were rumors that there was going to be a sequel to TLK, or I, I thought maybe a comic book would come out. I didn't know. I didn't want to make anything and put my heart into it, only for it to be retconned. Uh, Sam fully admits that he put uh, Finest Hour off for like three years because he just didn't feel like using certain figures. The, ho ho hold on, hold on. That's part of it. That, that's part of that it. Is the amount of times we talk about Finest Hour behind the scenes, you'd be like, I kind of wanted to do this, but I've just lost interest in it. The figures aren't fun to use. I just, I don't know if I want to go through with this film. Like the amount of times the film almost got canceled purely because of like figures or passion. You just didn't have it. So so don't give blame it all on Paramount here. Oh, no, 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 no. What are you calling me out? No, I'm not. 
blame it all on Paramount. No, like like there were a lot of factors, but I didn't want to go ahead and write an entire script if I knew it it, it just wasn't going to work. But Do yeah, you know what's I, that would be the best outcome of this? Uh huh. Surprise two years from now. Surprise comic book, the new Skybound Mayday alternate, you know, TLK ending and completely retcons you. Now that you've made the film, they're gonna it's gonna happen. Yeah, it's just, just the, you wait. That's just the way it's gonna work. But yeah. Um Yeah, so I I didn't like the script ideas we had. Third parties came out, DLXs came out, and I just got this wave of inspiration go through and I thought, okay. Didn't you also get a Fun, a paycheck from Cooler 8, too? Yes, Cooler 8 <laughs> bought the DLX Optimus that ended up breaking. Um, I I just got this overwhelming rush of inspiration on how to do it, and I realized the best way for me to tell a TLK sequel was to tell a personal story. And it was to focus on Optimus and his mental state and his aggression and him coming to terms with that. It was to also show... The, the regression of Megatron. He's finally by himself. He's no longer controlled by anyone because since, if you follow the comic books, he's been manipulated by the Fallen for a long time and he's never been his own character. And now that he's finally his, he was finally his own character in Finest Hour and he realized he, he, he's sick of this. He, he's, he's totally done. And I've always loved Prime and Megatron interacting and acting as if they're brothers once again. So that was really fun to work on, to script those moments and to make them feel real and like there's a history there. So I knew a smaller story would work, despite the fact that it's about Unicron waking up. And the story of Unicron I used as a storytelling tool to develop Optimus and Megatron. Unicron's not the main focus. He's just used to tell the audience things about Optimus and Megatron. And I and he, even Bumblebee too, his character grows into someone more emotionally stable. He's not so much like a, ch- a kid or a child anymore. He's really grown and learns to overcome his own emotions. This child's about to kick your ass. <laughs> um, I, I was going to say, I love how you, made, you wrote Megatron is more compassionate to Autobots than his own teammates. But what happens to Barricade just makes me chuckle because Megatron's just like, hmm, shame. Well, he knew it was going to happen. There's no way he could stop it. Not uh, if he tried hard enough. There, there, there was a cut line that said that Megatron knew what was going to happen. Uh, Bumblebee asks him, like, you knew that was going to happen, didn't you? And Megatron goes, yeah, he took a bite from one of the parasites. I cut that because I didn't want to give that away. Just yeah, I wanted the audience to be like, huh? And then Cogman later explains that. Oh, one bite and you explode merely a cycle later. So didn't, didn't the Bumblebee you knew that was gonna happen still stay though? Just not the Megatron line? Yes, yeah, the Bumblebee line okay. stayed, stayed, yeah. Yeah. I was about to say, I'm like, is this like a Spider-Verse multiple versions in theater moment? Because I was like, mm. I swear a cut of cut of the film I saw had that line. Yeah, there's, there's another cut of Finest Hour that's one hour and three seconds, rather than four seconds. But uh, the way Finest Hour came out, I'm very proud of it. It's one of my favorite projects for sure, and I say that about every project. But I I thoroughly enjoy how it came out. I love that it's a small story. The voice cast nailed it, as they always do. I I appreciate I think it's one of those fun films where you bring out just a lot of different actors that have been in TFI, which I thought that was really neat. Even, like... And this is, like, when it comes to actors, uh, one actor finally got to do what he's been begging us to do for, like, years. Yeah, Stinky Blue Rat. Stinky Blue Rat um, has been wanting to voice for us for a while, but not just voice for us. Uh, voice Megatron. Megatron. Yes. Any uh, Megatron. It didn't even matter which. He just said let him voice a Megatron. Because he he originally auditioned for Beast Wars Megatron for Return to Earth, and he was the he was already... We were giving him screen tests. Like, it was neck and neck between him and... Uh, him, Joe, and then wasn't there another person in the running? I don't remember. But I know for sure on the top list was Stinky Blue Rat and Crosshairs Productions. And then, yeah. And so it was like those two. And then Cross or Joe just, you know, slightly nudged him out. And so we were like, okay, he'll be Rat Trap and then we'll, you know, get him as... So finally, he finally got to do a Megatron. Waspinair, did I say Rat Trap? You said Rat Trap. Oh, I meant to say Waspinair. My brain said Waspinair. I don't know why I said Rat Trap. Uh, so, yeah, it was... <laughs> Cooler, I even paid Stinky Blue to do a cameo, 
where he's like, yeah, I, if I don't get to voice Megatron, this one or that one. And it's like when Finest Hour was announced, he tweeted me and DM'd me saying, like, please let me audition. So he sent me an uh, uh, audition, and his voice sounded great, even with effects. Mm-hmm. Uh, his audio required a little bit of cleaning up because he did use his phone, but it came out really well. And he sounds excellent. Like, nobody knew that was Stinky Blue Rat until the yeah. end credits rolled, and they were shocked by it. No, one of my favorite things is, like, I, I kind of pushed you to use him because you originally were going to try and do it yourself, but we agreed that since this is TLK Megatron, it should sound more like Frank Welker's Megatron rather than Hugo Weaving's, and your Megatron is more of the Hugo Weaving. Yeah. There actually is a cut out there. A Finest Hour cut. I don't know if it's still around, but where I voiced um, Megatron, because early on I... uh, Because Stinky Blue had probably the second most amount of lines for this project. He's a very busy content creator. So it took him some time to get his lines in. He actually delivered his lines, I think, two weeks or a week before the actual film was completed and set to release. So... I recorded Megatron lines of myself so I could have the pacing set right. And I I liked my lines, despite the fact they sounded too Hugo. And I said, well, if Stinky Blue can't deliver, I'll always have my backup lines. Then he delivered. I added the effects, threw them in, and I was blown away. I'm like, God, these work so well. He matches the figure. And Stinky Blue did a lot of improv, too. Uh, mm-hmm. On a few lines, he added some lines that weren't actually in the script. Uh, the whole Unicron be gone, he improv that. That was not part of the script. There are times where uh, Megatron calls Optimus brother. That was not in the script. Like, he really started to ad lib by the end of his lines because he mm-hmm. was getting really into it. Once he learned that his voice sounds great with effects and how it looked with the figure and, and everything he really spearheaded the rest of the lines and gave it his all. And he threw in some bloopers. <laughs> Oh, forty! I can't. I you need to send those to me. You need to show them to me at some point. This um, did I have any? Did I have any bloopers in mine? You, you always send me raw files. So I know because you ask for them. Yeah, I can guarantee you, you've got some in there. But uh, just because I love TFI, because like I love blooper reels with films, like uh, the Jurassic Spark ones. One I always go back to. Oh, I love that. But, like, there was a part where Stay Stinky Blue is a part where Megatron goes, you know, that was a joke, Optimus. And Stinky Blue in his Megatron voice goes, Optimus, it was a joke, just like Ligma. Oh, my God. <laughs> I'm like, this is how you know you're working with Stinky Blue Rat. No, I, I love how this reminds me of the amount of times, like, you'll do a film and do temp lines. Although, most of the time, you don't actually get another actor. You go, you know what? Temp lines are good enough. I have it with Rhinox and Return to Earth. Yes. Um, I was gonna say, and then what other like actor? We we had a good cast. Um, uh, we brought in a new actor we've never used before. Is his name is he goes by the name Rambling Rob? He does a bunch of comic book reviews on on, on his YouTube. I met him in person uh, a couple months ago because he he doesn't live too far from me, and he first started working with the name brand on his stuff, and I got sent an audition for Unicron. And he sounded so good. Like, he sounded excellent. He sounded like a, a perfect blend of, like, Orson Welles and, like, a, the, the deepness that I was looking for. And he was casted immediately. Uh, one thing I like about Finest Hour, you know, there there was a decent amount of, like, newer actors brought in. Like, I think Quintessa, this was her first time voicing a TFI project. Were some of the Knights new actors? Yeah, all, um, all except one. So uh, Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Yes, yeah, St- Steelbane was a... a sp- Spooky D man, but um, uh, Storm Raid was David Podney, and David, some of you may know, who does a really good um, Optimus Prime impression that goes around. He voices Optimus in the name brand company stuff. But I brought him in as a Storm Rain, and he just he his voice has a presence, and with the night with that voice coming out of that night, it was so great like he really sounded like one of the knights from TLK and he really really just brought that character to life and I I love that voice like I think that might be one of my favorite voices he's done besides like like I like that more than than his Optimus impression like that 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 Storm Rain voice was was just awesome and then I think didn't wasn't Quintessa found through name brand as well no uh yes technically but I she was also Vortex in Combaticons 
Mm, that's right. That's right. So basically, two two of those characters were the Combaticons. Because David Podney was blast off. Oh my god, that's right. The knights are just the Combaticons. Yeah, go watch go watch Key and Carlisle's Combaticons film on either of his channels. It's a fun little fan animation. I helped with that. Um Yeah, you did. Yes. Yeah, so a trailer. A trailer. Congratulations. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> Got another uh, audition by two people, uh, Martini and uh, Brandon, I believe. Martini- I, I know Martini a bit, actually, because um, I work with on Emergence of a Prime with Merit Movies. Merit Movies has used Martini a couple times. I think he has was he? Beast Wars Megatron for his Beast Wars film, and then he's Cup in uh, Emergence of a Prime. I, oh, okay. Wow. Martini gets around. Um, that, that sounds weird. <laughs> Yeah, Mar- Martini did um, Skulltron, and that was really well done. And then Brandon did um, Dra- Draconicus, I think his name is, something like that. So yeah, the, the knights, were, most of the knights were all new people. But I also like that this film had a lot of like reoccurring actors, and it was also nice to see. It's a lot of reoccurring actors, but not a lot of ones we use a lot. Like I know Hound was voiced by Merit Movies. First mm-hmm. time he came back, uh, he was hoist in. Um, Jurassic Spark. Alex Justice and Sky Buttram, they have both have voiced in TFI projects way in the past, but they haven't actually come back for a while. Uh, there, there just wasn't the, uh, the, the room in the in projects, but for Finest Hour, I definitely wanted to bring in Sky as Crosshairs because they do a fantastic Crosshairs voice. And the only mm-hmm. reason why I never brought them in as Crosshairs in the past is because I was kind of gatekeeping Crosshairs. <laughs> I love doing his voice, but I... I was already voicing Bumblebee and Cogman, and I think someone else. So I didn't want to do too much to begin with. So didn't I, Joe want to be Cogman? Yeah, Joe wanted to be Cogman, but he went when he asked. I already had my Cogman lines recorded, but Joe was bull, bulldog. Bulldog, so, yes. Yeah, it, it, the British man. Got, he got, got to do one British voice. Yes, he did. Um, and Alex Justice did Barricade, and he hasn't done Barricade since Interstellar. <laughs> was the Interstellar remake the last time Alex just did Barricade? Uh, that was the last time he did Barricade, yeah. Oh wow. Yeah, he's voiced oh, for he's voiced for us between those projects, but yeah, he hasn't been Barricade yeah. since uh, since that. And, and then Hot Rod was a re- another actor we've used before. Oh, I I have to give so much credit to Christmas Wolf or Christmas Wolf. I I loved his Hot Rod. I, th- that right character, in his ugly face, right in his ugly face. I love. And this might be tooting my own horn with my writing, but I loved Hot Rod in Finest Hour. He was so much fun to write. And it's just, he, the, that character points so much in that film because that that figure has articulated fingers. And I he points like over six or seven times in that film. And Christmas Wolf just, it, it, the takes he would give me were so funny. And it, it bounced off so well with the other characters and just every actor brought their a game and you have aiden as optimus he's always been a a reliable optimus for us i see him as the baverus prime uh of course we had mk and coolerite as two little decepticons decepticons one and three (laughs) baby let's get off oh man is drift the only one that doesn't talk in that film drift does not talk yeah I think it's just we didn't find an actor for Drift because I think Hound wasn't supposed to talk either. But then we're like, we got to get Merit movies. Uh, it, no, it's true. It's true. Uh, but yeah, so I just I couldn't figure out anything for Drift, and he wasn't vital for the story, so he, he just never made it uh, in there. And I I think this was this was my favorite project voicing Bumblebee. I voiced B a lot in the past, and this was it was the first time getting to voice a more mature Bumblebee. A bumblebee, a bumblebee that didn't need my higher voice for the whole thing. It was a bumblebee that w- was actually a little bit deeper most of the time. And his more seriousness bouncing off of Christmas Wolf's hot rod. Yeah, I, yeah, I, right I want one of those. Is, ah, I love it. Uh, Finest Hour it came out really well. And I, I'm i sad it's over. You know, I love working on Hearts of Steel right now with... Uh, Carlos or, or or Ram Works, as some some of you may know him. I love working on Hearts of Steel, but I will always miss the previous project that I was working on. Finest Hour was a long one, and then I'll use that to segue into Hearts of Steel because that's what people can look forward to, as well as still haven't released Raw. What might have been? I'm waiting on that one. Um, okay. 
There's no rush for rollout what might have been. I kind of want to put all my focus in Hearts of Steel. That is going to be very unique. And it already is a unique project working with all these figures that turn into trains and like steampunky looking triplanes. And this film's going to have a lot of those digital transformations. And it's had three already in the shoots we've had. And I think they're some of the best digital transformations we've done so far. I don't mind the close-up physical transformations, but they don't look as flashy and cool, and you're almost not... Like, when you see the digital ones, it's you, you, you're you seeing them physically transform in front of you in one go. And it's a little easier with the trains, because when they transform, because they're trains and they're old and they're made of, like, steel and, and train parts, I figured when they transform, steam is going to go everywhere. But so are sparks, because they're grinding against each other. There's a shot where <clears throat> uh, the character of Scourge transforms, and when his trailer appears, it sparks appear along the ground as it's grinding on the rails to get into position. His smokestack comes up, and sparks fly out because it's literally grinding on the steel train. So the transformations are meant to look almost rough and painful. And industrial, like kind of a industrial revolution, you know? Just kind of that... Pure metal, less or tech, less techno organic element of Transformers, and more of this. This is a piece of metal that is scraping against each other, but it, 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 it looks painful, like you said. It just does not look right. Yeah, and I'm, I'm very, I can't talk too much about it because it's still fresh. But the script is fully done. It's been sent out to cast members. MK, you need to get a ball, your ball rolling on that one too. Oh, when you, when f more filming is done, I'll, I'll do my lines. Because you're a star scream. You need, to, you, you need to get your lines in. Uh, it's going to be a fun project. It might not be done for at least two months at the minimum because, again, projects do take about a month and a half to film. Uh, it really depends on the com complicatedness. Jurassic Spark was filmed in a month, which was shocking, but that didn't involve a lot of set pieces or choreography. Cho or, or choreography. Hearts of Steel has a lot of train driving that we have to figure out how to do. You can't really pull the strings too well on train tracks. Otherwise, the trains will snag on the track and the whole track will go with it. Some of these trains that we're using that are customs, that are meant to be other characters, those trains are actually battery operated. So those ones will be a lot easier, yeah. And for one of the pyrotechnic scenes, because th th there's a part, and we revealed this in the poster, it's okay to talk about it. There's a scene where there's Prowl, Ratchet, and Hound. They're all in their alt modes. And they're all hooked up together. So Prowl is the train, Ratchet is a is like a passenger car in the middle, and Hound is like a a, a, a caboose with a gun sticking out of it. And yeah. they're hauling something, and they're being chased by these seekers. And so that train is battery operated. So when we activate that, we're gonna have the explosives set up around the track, and have the elect and have the electric train go through it, and film that. And that's going to look so cool. We'll have the train just go in a perfect circle so it can pass through the explosives multiple times to get the, the right... And the explosives go for three minutes. So we can just have three minutes of footage of the train just passing through these explosives. Well, it's going to be 30 seconds before we're arrested by a park ranger and fined, yeah. but yes. <laughs> park ranger? We're still in the suburbs. There's no one that patrols those parks? No. We're going to get mauled by a deer before that happens. Mauled by a deer? <laughs> mauled by a deer. But yeah, so Heart to Steal is something to look forward to, and I look forward to filming it while we're at TFCon. And do we want to do any, like, TFCon, um, I feel like we're going to be doing some things in the public eye, because uh, we're going to be there Saturday and Sunday, correct? Yeah, we will be at TFCon Toronto this year, in July. We'll be there Saturday and Sunday. Uh, if you're going to be in that area and want to pop by and say hi, a few of us will be wearing TFI merch. Yeah. We're easy. We'll be wearing the TFI shirts. Uh, Sam should have business cards to give out to people. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I've been, I've been, I'm running out. I've been giving them out. Um, hell, my, my niece had her birthday party today, and two of her friends walked away with TFI shirts. <laughs> I, uh, Sam, um, Sam will be signing any first aid you want him to. Uh, oh, okay. It costs it costs five dollars a signature, and it goes straight to me. What? At that point, I should just get my own booth. Yeah, we are. It's gonna be in the parking lot. <laughs> I'm gonna get a little table, a little table and umbrella, and be like CFI signature. Oh my god! In no. the parking lot. Okay. Uh, complete jokes. Uh, you, Sam can choose if he wants. If you, you know, if you want to take a photo with Sam or to get him to sign anything, that's up to him. That's more than fine. Don't just don't pay me for it. <laughs> don't. 
Uh, but yeah, w- we will be there at TFCon buying figures, having a good time. Uh, there will be other uh, Transformers YouTubers there as well that we might be, you know, uh, hanging out with. So it's gonna be it's gonna be a real fun time, definitely for sure. Uh, it was great last year with with everybody. It's gonna just be the same thing this year. I'm trying to save up a bit more money this year so I can. Come I'm gonna home. have less money than I did last year. Yeah, but we we have to do do a Toys R Us trip again for sure. I'm not spending anything on the Toys R Us, but yeah, sure. We still yeah, have to we go. Can do that. That'll be fun. Yeah, uh, if you're following me on uh, Twitter or Instagram, I will definitely be posting things uh, toward closer towards TFCon, where we're at, what we're doing. So, you, and if you're going to be there, you, you you can look for us on Instagram. Uh, we'll be giving updates there. If you're part of the Discord, I'll probably post some updates there as well. And if you're going to be there, like, hit us up. Well, that'll do it for this podcast. We had a lot to talk about. We talked about Rise of the Beast, a bit of Spider-Verse, Finest Hour, and Hearts of Steel. This was a very, very more defined podcast this time. Next podcast episode, I don't want to give... I Not everything's been set in stone, but don't be surprised if there's more guests than you would think. Definitely, That's yeah. all I'll say. Yeah, don't, definitely. Yeah, they're, 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 the next podcast episode, episode three might have a... Might be a bit special. That's all I'll say on that. Watch it come back and it's just... Wait, is there something I don't know? It's something we haven't talked about, but something I've been mean to talk to you about, episode three. Oh. So so, so that's why... That's why... That's what I'm saying. I, there's not too much... Not all the details have been set through, but... I can't promise that it will, but... There's a there's a chance the next episode's going to be a little different. Okay, okay. Well, I'm looking forward to it because I don't even know what's going on. <laughs> uh, but this this was a good time. MK, thank you again for getting the ball rolling on this. It's unfortunate we took so long, but hey. It, it's all right. It it's still coming happens. out this month. That's all that matters. Yep. Oh, I got to get the ball rolling on this edit yeah. real quick. Um, so, yeah, uh, we'll see you guys in the very next podcast. What that will be in sometime July. next month in July. Yep, yep. All right, guys, fare thee well. We'll see you next time. <laughs> <laughs>